When the Lord first put this series on my heart some uh, weeks ago, you probably remember I was planning to do something else. There was something else I was going to preach, and we were looking forward to doing that. And, and the Lord just spoke to me about the warfare that's going on in our world right now. And all the warfare that you guys are fighting every day and all the, the agitation, the, the turbulence out there in the spiritual atmosphere. So we've been talking about winning the invisible battle, winning the invisible war. And uh, we're continuing with that today. Last Sunday, we talked about what strongholds are, where they exist, how they operate. So today, we're going to talk about destroying spiritual strongholds. So our, our text is still 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and I encourage you to go ahead and find that, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And I want to emphasize something, and I know you've gotten this, this uh, impression from me already, but I, I am not discouraged, I'm not downhearted, I, I'm not worried at all about what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to tell you this morning and emphasize we will, in fact, let me rephrase that, we have already won this war. We, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory to the next victory. We are not questioning how this thing is all going to pan out. We have read the back of the book and God wins this thing. And when we win, the Bible teaches we will rule and reign with Christ on on his throne. Nevertheless, it's important that we be equipped. It's important that we be dressed for battle. Ephesians chapter 6 says, put on the full armor of God. Familiar with that? We're to have the helmet of right, helmet of salvation, blessed prayer of righteousness, the shield of faith, our feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, and, and we get all suited up for battle. But Ephesians 6 doesn't say anything about fighting the battle. It just says something about being prepared for the battle. Because if we dress for battle, and if we take our place in the army of the Lord, we know that God, our mighty conqueror and warrior, will fight on our behalf. And here's the first key I'm putting on the screen today. I've got a few of these. These are things that I call visibility keys, things that you can see in the Word of God to help you win the invisible war. And here's the first one. The victory is ours. Because the battle is the Lord's. The victory is ours because the battle is the Lord's. So we want to break this down today. Last time we talked about what spiritual strongholds are. You might remember the five things I gave you. They're located in the mind of the believer. They're made up of good thoughts. They often develop in the shadow of great strengths. They are sometimes activated by painful trauma, and they actually create in your life a double-mindedness. I didn't deal with double-mindedness last week, and I'm not going to take time to do with it today, but it's in James chapter 5. It says, if a person believes but is filled with doubt, he's driven by the wind of the sea and that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord because he is a double-minded man unstable in all of his ways. A few years back in fact Pastor Meredith and the definitive team that they wrote a song about it. We talked about double-mindedness. I did a series called Double Trouble and double-mindedness is a stronghold. Some days you believe, some days you don't believe. It's actually being schizophrenic spiritually. Some days you have faith, other days you're filled with fear. You don't know who you are. It's double-mindedness, which is a stronghold that prevents you from receiving anything from God. So I came in and I was studying this week, and I, I want to be really frank with you this morning. Th this message didn't come to me very easy. This message didn't come to me very quick. Now, it it'll be simple, and, and I know you'll grasp it. It says, Pastor Coach, you must be pretty simple-minded to take all week to figure this out. <laughs> That's okay. I'll let you preach next Sunday. <laughs> but I felt like there was um, a lot of operating in the spirit realm uh, that would not want you to hear the simple things that I'm going to tell you today. And uh, I, I research, and I've got a lot of resources. I've got a lot of material available to me online. And, uh, and none of them really gave me what I was looking for. So I just asked the Holy Spirit to give it to me himself. How many believe that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good way of doing it? So I've got four things today that I'm going to give you very, very simple on how to destroy spiritual strongholds in your life. Here's number one. 
how to destroy a spiritual stronghold. What's a stronghold? Of course, it's a way of thinking. It is a mindset. It's something that you think about and it creates a mind pattern in you that is really not true. So the first thing you must do to destroy a stronghold is discern or recognize what that stronghold is. In order to destroy it, you have to know what it is. And so that requires discernment. Now, now don't think that you can just be blessed with the gift of discernment and the Holy Spirit tell you what your stronghold is. I know i got to say these things quickly this morning, but there is no gift of discernment in the New Testament. It's the gift of discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is when the Holy Spirit will help you understand the source or the origin of something. That's a gift of the Spirit, the gift of discerning of spirits, but discernment itself is not a gift. It is a lifestyle. It's a learned skill. I think there's three things that create your ability to discern. Number one is your knowledge of the Word of God. If your discernment is not based on the Word of God, you're going to discern all the wrong things. So the Word of God is just like your conscience. Don't base your life on your conscience. Don't don't think like you're a Jiminy Cricket and let your conscience be your guide. If you let your conscience be your guide, and if your conscience is not trained in the Word of God, your conscience will get you in trouble because the culture will give you a conscience or the lack of one because it is a seared conscience that is not in alignment with the word of God and you'll get in trouble. So the first thing to have discernment is a knowledge of the word of God. The second is you have to have a prayer life. If you're not praying, if you're not talking to God, if you're not in communion with Jesus, then all the knowledge of the Word of God will just be head knowledge. It'll just be information. It'll just be things that you've memorized rather than applying the gift of the Spirit in your life. So you got to know the Word. you got to activate it with your prayer life. And then this is thirdly, your life must be conditioned by the relationship that you have with the Holy Spirit. Because he's not going to announce things boldly. Often he's going to speak to you with the still small voice. Do you remember Elijah? Elijah thought God would be in the whirlwind and he wasn't. He thought God would be in the fire and he wasn't. He thought that God would be in the earthquake and he wasn't. God was in the still small voice. So if you're going to discern or recognize what strongholds are, take your knowledge of the word of God, condition it with prayer, and enhance your relationship with the Holy Spirit and ask him to reveal things to you you. Just like David said, search me and know me. Try my heart. See if there be any deficiency. See if there be any wrong. See if there be any, quote, strongholds inside of me. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal them to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind. Remember, strongholds often get activated by how? Trauma, pain in your life. So ask the Holy Spirit. I know it's not fun. But ask him to remind you of the painful things that you've been through and then ask yourself, is there any stronghold, is there any wrong thinking that got rooted in my heart when I went through that very difficult experience? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. For example, is there any bitterness towards someone that has wronged you? It's a stronghold. Is there any bitterness in general? Because you have been protecting yourself from future pain. It's a stronghold. Is there any fear that paralyzes you from moving forward? Because when you've been hurt, you become fearful of being hurt again. And then you make decisions based on fear. Let me give you another key this morning in your life. This is something I have learned the hard way. I'd rather help you learn this the easy way than learning it the hard way like I did. Any decision you ever make in your life that's based on fear. If you are fearful about something and you make a decision concerning that out of fear, every time you make a fear-based decision, it will be a wrong decision. It will cause more problems. It will create a worse environment than the one that you're afraid of. And it's like Job said, that which I dread and fear the most has come upon me. But ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what what strongholds are there? Is there a broken self-portrait? Is there fear? Is there anger, whatever it is. You see, a lot of people in the Bible had strongholds. 
I know we love them. I know we're proud of them, and I know that God puts them in the Word of God because they're wonderful examples to us. But they're examples to us in their excellence. They're also examples to us sometimes in their deficiencies. And a lot of people in the Word of God, there's nobody perfect in the Bible except Jesus. But everybody outside of Jesus was human just like we are. It doesn't mean they're bad people. didn't mean they were unspiritual. didn't mean that God couldn't use them. But there was something in their life that had caused them to get messed up. In their thinking. Let me give you some examples. Gideon. You remember Gideon? He was all messed up in his thinking. He had a broken self-portrait. God appeared to him and said, The Lord be with you, mighty warrior. And he was so broken, he didn't think God could be talking to him. Because he saw himself as a loser. He saw everybody in his family line a loser. And, And God couldn't use him greatly until he got delivered from this stronghold of a poor self-portrait. David, I'm going to talk about David for just a few minutes. The Holy Spirit gave me some of this, so so receive it. I think David had a stronghold in his life. I, I love David. He's the sweet singer of Israel, obviously man after God's own heart. Wonderful, wonderful thing about David, but he had a stronghold in his life. And, and stick with me. How many of the Bible says he's a man after what? God's own heart. Now, what's that mean? I've studied into that over the years. I think one thing, and this is usually the first answer that people give, David is a man after God's own heart. That means he knew how to repent. He he knew how to cry bitter tears of repentance and and repent before God after he had sinned, and he was a man after God's heart because God's heart is one of repentance, And, and that could certainly be true. But another thing about David that made him a man after God's heart is that David was a mighty warrior. David had a warring spirit. I have taught in previous months or years that a warring spirit attracts the presence of the Holy Spirit to your life. If you want the presence of God to show up big in your life, then get excited and become a warrior against something. Don't just float downstream. Don't, don't just let any, any uh, thing come along and not impact you, but develop a warrior spirit. And, and David certainly had a warrior spirit. It attacked to track the Holy Spirit to his life. However, you remember what I said? That strongholds can sometimes get developed in the shadow of your greatest strengths. I think on occasion, this is my opinion, it's, it's not necessarily an um, uh, infallible word, but it, it's in my heart. I think David had a stronghold because he was overly aggressive and he allowed this warring spirit sometimes to go unchecked. He, he was a violent, he was a warring man. He, he had been attacked all of his life. So he'd learned to fight back. He'd been attacked by bears, lions. He'd even been attacked by his own son. So he had a tendency to fight back. Now the problem was, and Brother Mitchell mentioned this on Wednesday night, and it really got me to thinking. When David fought the, I guess, last battle of his life, which is really the one that we need to remember his legacy over, when he was being chased by Saul and Saul was trying to take his life. Remember that story? David is out in the wilderness and and he finds Saul. Saul's up in a cave and and David sneaks in and Saul is sleeping and he had his spear. He could have easily, as a warring spirit, as a warrior of David, he could have easily walked up and put the spear through Saul's heart and killed his enemy. Because he was attacking him, Saul would have done the same thing to David if he had had the chance. But you remember the story? He didn't take the spear and kill his enemy. He took the spear and he cut off the edge of Saul's garment and then gave it to a servant and said, I want you to take this and show him that I was there. I had the opportunity to destroy him. And at many times in David's life, if that would have have been his opportunity, he would have done it. But I really think he had learned to deal with this stronghold of anger in his life. And I really loved what Brother Mitchell said Wednesday night. The greatest legacy of David's life, this is so powerful. The greatest legacy of his life was not so much in killing Goliath, but in not killing Saul. Isn't that awesome? 
His stronghold of being an angry, warring spirit didn't get the best of him. See, these guys are human. Let's talk about Elijah. Wow. He's the prophet of God. He, he called down fire from heaven. I'm not just talking about fire. I'm talking about fire. I mean, you know, you, you know it's of the Holy Ghost when it's fire. Fuego. So, sorry. That's my attempt at being bilingual. And if you prod me for other attempts, all I'm going to start talking about is Mexican food, and I'm going to get hungry, and then we're all going to be in trouble. But Elijah, he had a stronghold. What was it? He had a tendency to get deeply depressed. It was a thought pattern. He's a prophetic personality, and often that opened the door to swings of emotion and depression. He had to recognize that. He didn't recognize it for years. And you remember I talked about him being in the cave a few weeks ago? He's up in the cave and he's feeling sorry for himself and he's he's muttering. He's talking to himself rather than talking to God about his problem. And if you talk to yourself all the time and and mutter your problems rather than talking to God about your problems, you say, Pastor Coates, I can't talk to God. I can't be honest to God. If you've got a God that you can't be honest with, you've got the wrong God. Because Jesus had a God that when Jesus didn't understand, he asked questions. He said, my God, my God, why? Hast thou forsaken me? And we got a bunch of people in the body of Christ today that said, well, I never ask God any questions. My my statement is, well, I guess then you don't get very many answers, do you? It's okay to ask God questions. And finally, Elijah dealt with his stronghold. Instead of muttering to himself about his problems, he started talking to God. And then God revealed him the way out of the cave. Anybody... Tracking with what I'm saying today. I don't know who you relate with. Maybe it's somebody else. You, you, could, you could look at basically anybody <laughs> in the Bible, the great hero of faith, and they all had strongholds. <laughs> Abraham was a liar. For fear, he said his wife was his sister because he was chicken. He was scared. Thanks, Jerry. If I need more sound effects, I'll, I know I got you right up on the front row. I appreciate that. Are you with me? So ask the Holy Spirit. Discern what your stronghold is. And then here's number two. You must actively wage war against the stronghold. Once you know what it is, you have got to actively wage war against it. Don't accept it. Don't get used to it. Don't just think you'll have to learn to live with it. Don't don't just say, well, this is the way God made me. Just Don't just say, well, this is what it's like in my culture. Don't just say, well, this is how we all think in this family. Don't think this, this is just like a generational curse that's been passed down and we've all just learned to do the best we can and get by. No! Actively fight in the Spirit against this thing. Now, don't fight in the flesh because you can't win a spiritual battle with a flesh and blood weapon. But if it's a spiritual battle, fight with spiritual weapons because the Bible says there in the fourth verse that spiritual weapons have divine power. I want to fight with weapons that have divine power. And I'll tell you, divine power is a whole lot better than gun power. Somebody say amen. Divine power is better than gunpowder. You can quote me on that. That's a new revelation, Miss uh, Naomi. I just had that this morning. I looked over at you, and the Holy Spirit just gave me that revelation about gunpowder. I, I don't know where that came from, but that's, that's okay. But God has divine power. Let me list these things for you. I'll, I'll hurry real quick. You know what? Weapons in your life that have divine power are things like prayer. Obviously, a huge weapon. Or, or faith. Faith is a huge weapon. 1 John 5, 4, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith is the victory. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the confession of our mouth, 
I know everybody knows Revelation 12. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But I want to, to, to remind you that it is the word of your testimony that is a weapon that has divine power for you to destroy strongholds in your life. I thought I had this in the notes in, in the first service. It wasn't on the screen. I guess I didn't put it in the slides. But if you remember Isaiah 54, 17, I'll begin to quote it and you'll remember it. Isaiah 54, 17 is the one that says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. How many remember that one? The weapon might be formed, but it shall not prosper. Here's what that verse goes on to say. And you shall refute Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now, here's the wrong version, the wrong mindset about that verse. We think that it says in our mindset, we are tended to believe that it says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that is raised in accusation shall God refute. That's not what it says. It says, every weapon that is raised against you, you shall refute. You shall lift up your voice. You shall speak. And with the confession of your mouth, you have the authority to enforce the vindication that God has promised to give you. And it is your confession out of your mouth. You have authority to pull down strongholds. Uh, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. The uh, last one I'll mention to you of these weapons is the Word of God. The Word of God is a tremendous weapon of divine power in your life. And when Jesus is fighting, the, resisting temptation in the wilderness, what did he say? Three times. It is written, it is written, it is written. He did not say, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. He did not say, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling. He did not say, and I love you, Pastor Meredith, but he did not say, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing. I'm creating, I'm creating, I'm creating. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. Nothing wrong with all those things I've said. But what he said is, it is written, it is written. It is written. And I, I would recommend you, you get some go-tos in, in your spiritual vocabulary. For example, when the stronghold says you were born that way, here's what you need to say. Well, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Marvel not that a man must be born again. I was born the first time with my earthly father's DNA. And yes, there were some problems. There were some hereditary things that impacted me. But I was born again the second time with the DNA of my heavenly father. And my divine heredity is heavenly. 1 Peter 1.23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. When the stronghold says you can't change, when the stronghold says you've tried, when the stronghold says you don't have enough willpower to stop doing that, when the stronghold says you've been living this way and thinking this way all your life and you expect to be able to change it now, when the stronghold says that, you speak the word of God if any man is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. When the stronghold says you're weak, you say with the apostle Paul, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. Are you with me? So, we got two of them down. We're going to destroy strongholds by recognizing the stronghold, actively waging war against the stronghold. And here's number three. You must take captive every thought. Verse five. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to obey Christ. 
Now, if you take something captive, I, just think about this with me. I was thinking in, in the office and in, in, in writing these things down. What does it mean to take something captive? If, if you take something captive, what are you doing? You're imprisoning. You, you first of all, arrest that thing. You, you stop that thing in its tracks. You, you, you prevent it from continuing to do what it's doing. You arrest that. Then you take it as a hostage and you submit it to the authority that it must surrender to. That, that's what a deputy does. If a deputy sees you going down Spring Hill Drive, and please stop doing that. I know it's none of you people, but people drive down Spring Hill Drive, which the speed limit right here is 45 miles an hour. You cannot at any time get on down Spring Hill Drive and not be passed by do, people doing 55 and 65 every single day. And if a deputy sheriff sees you doing that, he's going to arrest you. And if you have a bad record or if you fight back, he's probably going to incarcerate you and imprison you. And then what is he going to do? He's going to submit you to the warden at the county jail. And when we arrest thoughts, we say, I'm not going to continue to give you permission to run roughshod over my mind. I'm not going to let you continue occupy territory between my two ears that you don't rightly have the, op- uh, 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 the authority to occupy that territory because my mind is the mind of Christ. It's the word of God. It's the life of Jesus that inhabits my mind, will, and my emotion. So arrest thoughts. Take them as hostages. Submit them to the warden, Jesus Christ, because you have the man, the, the mind of Christ, and require them to cease and desist because there's a new sheriff in town. And the sheriff that rules over my mind is the mind of Christ. Strongholds, where do they get started? They start in the mind. And someone said our thoughts can build walls in our mind, in our thinking, one brick at a time. How are, how are uh, walls built? One brick at a time. Wrong thinking becomes just another brick in the wall of our wrong thinking of a spiritual stronghold. And what we must do is take captive every thought and not allow that brick to become another brick in the wall, on the wall of a stronghold, a wrong manner of thinking, but take captive every thought. And the most effective, in my opinion, one of the most effective ways that you can do this, and and to me, this is worth the price of admission for you this morning. And for some of you, you're getting a really good bargain. Just saying. But use your mouth. Okay, to do what? To manage your mind. Use your mouth to pre-program the thoughts that your mind is going to think about. Now, I've taught this a few times over the years. I'll do it quickly. But it's the law of words. It's the power of words because actions are the direct result of thoughts Thoughts are the direct result of words, and words are the direct result of what we allow to our our ears to hear. So let me read this for you real quick. Uh, I choose to hear words with my ears, number one. Number two, I choose to believe in my heart what I chose to hear with my ears. Number three, I choose to meditate on in my mind what I chose to believe in my heart based on what I chose to hear with my ears. Number four, I choose then to speak with my mouth what I have been meditating on in my mind because I chose to believe them in my heart based on what I chose to hear with my ears. Number five, how many are getting confused? Say, please wrap it up. There's only five. I choose to conduct my life. As if the words that I speak out of my mouth were true, that's based because I meditated on them in my mind because that's what I believed in my heart based on the words that I heard with my ears. So where can you stop the process before it gets started? Pre-programming what your mind is going to think about by using your own words to create the atmosphere in which you live. I know you can't stop the noise. How many? There's a lot of noise in the culture right now. There's a lot of talk. 
There's a lot of people saying things they don't know what in the round world they're talking about. And I know you can't necessarily stop all of that. But what you can do is refuse to meditate on it. You can refuse to repeat it. You can refuse to meditate on it. You can refuse to listen to it. And the best way to do that is to use your own lips, your own mouth, to speak your own words. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. So the words that come out of my mouth, may the words of my heart, of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. If death and life's in the power of the tongue, I'm going to let my own words create the environment I live, and the words that come out of my mouth are going to create the atmosphere that my mind thrives on, and I'm going to pre-program what my mind thinks about with the words that come out of my mouth are you getting a hold of that you say pastor coach well words aren't really all that important well tell that to the father that sent his only begotten son into the world and called him the word of God because words are the essence of thoughts everybody okay so here's number four you must then determine to walk in victory Once the stronghold is broken, once we choose to to break that thing, we we reveal it, it's discerned, it's waged war against, it's defeated, we're speaking the truth, we must determine to continue to walk in the victory. Because there's nothing that will prevent the enemy from not wanting to re-erect, rebuild that wall of wrong thinking In your mind. And just about the time you think you've got it conquered. If you don't continue walk in the victory that's in Christ. You will find the enemy wanting to bring back in those thoughts. And reintroduce them. And re-put one more brick in the foundation of that wall of a stronghold. And that's why you must continually keep on renewing your mind. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There's no reason for strongholds to remain in our lives. And I'm done, but I want to step down here and just talk to you out of my heart and ask the Holy Spirit to help me bring the application that needs to be brought. There is never any condemnation in this room, at least not from this pastor towards anybody that would ever walk into this building. There is a lot of compassion and love because I know everyone in this room has areas that your mind has led you to think and believe things that aren't true. Hurts, pains, disappointments, a lot of things. And strongholds get established. A a stronghold is is like a mindset. In in fact, Pastor Cesar mentioned to me this a couple days or weeks ago during the intermission of the two services because we're talking about strongholds. And we mentioned that a stronghold is a fortress. It's, It's a It's a fighting station. It's like a beachhead. And get this. If the enemy gets a stronghold in territory and he's created an outpost there, whenever he needs resupply, he doesn't have to go all the way back to the homeland. All he has to do is go back to the fortress and get resupplied. So when you let the enemy get a stronghold in your mind... He doesn't have to go back to hell to to get his next dart of of accusation. All he has to do is go back to that place that you've let him erect that beachhead in your life. You see how that works? You've, You've let him get a foothold. You've let him get a place in. And if you continue to do that, he'll take more and more and more and more and more. There's no turning him around if you don't resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. So I don't know what your strongholds are. I know what mine are, some of them. I've probably got a whole lot. But I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me deal with them. I I shared with you a couple of weeks ago 
on some things that happen in my life. How I have to deal with, with strongholds every day about trust and, and loyalty and confidence. And all, the, all those things are, are very important. I, I don't know how the enemy uses your past and your pain and your mindsets and, and your, your level of learning and everything that goes into it. I don't know how the devil uses that against you personally, but I know he does. But I also know you can take those things and submit them to the authority of Jesus Christ. Submit yourselves, therefore, then unto God, resisting the devil, and he will flee. So I want you to stand with me this morning. And if there's anyone in the room today that would like hands laid upon you, you'd like myself and other members of our prayer and ministry team to, to speak over you and pray over you, that's, that's what we're here for. But I'm not necessarily going to ask here publicly, okay, everybody has the stronghold of this or that, all raise your hands. And you know it, that's honestly between you and God. But I will ask you this morning to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll just simply in a generic way say, Pastor Coates, there are definitely some mindsets and the way that I'm thinking often that I know is the enemy trying to play games with me. He, he's trying to get a foothold. He's trying to live in my mind. Let me tell you what. He doesn't have authority to live in your mind. He, he doesn't have the right to live in your mind. He doesn't own your mind. You are bought with a price. The blood of Jesus Christ is what has purchased you from darkness into life. And only the mind of Christ is what is authorized to remain in your mind. Every thought of hell, every squatter from hell is unauthorized to be there. He needs to be kicked out and unoccupied and thrown out because he's an... <laughs> illegal that doesn't belong there so I speak over the people today and I just declare over them their mind that is controlled by the spirit is life and peace I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me with our mouth we can confess with our heart we can believe and in our mind we can declare what God said is true how I feel how I think how my emotions run roughshod over me how my past experiences and my pains try to manipulate me none of these things move me the word of the living God is what gives me the confidence that his plan for me is perfect and I believe what God said is true. Come on, lift your hands across the room this morning. <sighs> Holy Spirit, we cast down right now, cast out every high thing, every imagination, every thought pattern, every stronghold, every speculation, every manipulation, every contemplation, everything that the enemy would get our minds so wrapped up in all of this stuff that we get broken and confused. We cast it down. We cast it out. And we don't leave it empty because the Word of God says when a devil is cast out, if the spirit of occupation doesn't come and occupy that territory, the cast out spirit goes and brings back seven more devils with him and the end is worse than the beginning. So today we don't just vacate our minds, but we fill them with the Word of God. We occupy the territory with the promises of God that are yea and amen, the faithfulness of God, the truth of the word of God, not the lies of the enemy. And there is no room for the devil's foothold in my life because I'm so full of the spirit of God that there's no room for anything, any devil to get a word in edgeways. Oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I receive. I receive. Come on, lift your hands across the room with me. i got to let you go here really, really quickly. And I'll let you go just, just soon as the Holy Spirit lets, lets me get loose from this. But I'm going to tell you right now, God 
has the ability to set you free from strongholds. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, can you give God a hand clap of praise across this room this morning? Hallelujah. 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 How many say, Pastor, I think I'm getting free. I, I, I know I'm getting free. And I'll tell you, one of the things that God is setting the church free from is this mindset that says we got to stay in our little religious cocoons, that we can't get involved in the culture. We can't get involved in the government. We can't get involved in the public arena. I'll tell you what, we have got to get that mindset destroyed because that mindset is what has got us in the problems that we're in today. I don't blame the secular world. I don't blame the secular culture. I don't blame blame the secular humanists. I blame the church for staying inside of our little religious cocoon and not engaging with the culture like God would have us do. But I tell you what, we're coming out. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. This is my coming out day. Hallelujah. This is my coming out party. I will not stay silent anymore. Lion of, oh, I tell you what, we got moved on that song, did we, this morning, Pastor Meredith? Wasn't that fun? Woo! I mean, it, it's fun. I'm standing up here on the front row, and I'm thinking, wow, I think the roof is starting to lift off this building right now. I think the glory of God is starting to come into this house. And it is. And it's only going to get stronger because it's time for the lion to roar. It's the church is the, uh, what would I say? How is that phrase? Is the sleeping giant that it's about to be awakened. And the lion is going to roar. Come on. Give your neighbor a high five. I mean, get, give them a hand clay. Get, give them a shout. Get, give them a praise. Oh, praise God. Come on. Bless you, bless you, bless you. So my, my, uh, my permission today to you, they're even flashing the lights at me. I'm teasing. I give you permission today to have a good day, okay? I have permission and authorization for you to make this a very, very bad day for the devil and a very good day for you and your family and the kingdom. In Jesus' name, God bless you as you go.